Hi, welcome to the National Synchrotron Light Source 2, or NSLS2 for short. My name is Lisa Miller, and I'm a scientist here at Brookhaven National Laboratory, and I'll be your tour guide for this tour of NSLS2. Um, I'm standing right now in the lobby of NSLS2. Um, this is the lobby of a very bright X-ray machine. That's what NSLS2 does. We produce very bright X-rays uh, for doing experiments. Now, you may be familiar with X-rays um, when you go to the doctor or the dentist office, but the X-rays that we make are very different. They're extremely bright and extremely small beams of X-rays that we shine on very um, small samples in order to understand their atomic structure. So we want to look down into the very, very small parts of individual um, atoms and molecules. And that's what the synchrotron does. NSLS2 is one of five light sources in the country. Um, they're all uh, sponsored by the US Department of Energy. They're what we call a national user facility. And so scientists will come to NSLS2 from all over the world to do experiments on all different types of materials. They may be studying batteries. They may be studying drugs for um, diseases. Uh, they could be studying solar cells, lots of different things. Because in all cases, we want to use these x-rays to look into the very, very small components that they're made out of. And how they function. Over 2,000 scientists come to the NSLS2 every single year to use the facility and the reason we can take so many scientists at one time is because we have many experimental stations that we call beam lines where we collect these beams of uh, x-rays to do experiments. Today we're going to visit four beam lines and I'm going to show you how each of those are a little bit different from each other and describe a little bit about the science that gets done at them. At NSLS2 right now we have 28 operating beam lines um, but we're only about half built out. We still have space for up to 60 beam lines for even more experiments to be done in the future. So with that, um, I'm going to take you onto the experimental floor and we'll take a look at those beam lines. Come along. So the first stop on our tour is the accelerator tunnel, which is the heart of NSLS2. That's where we actually produce those bright x-rays for doing experiments. We produce the x-rays using electrons, and what we do is we take electrons, which are electricity, like you get from your electrical socket, we take those electrons and we accelerate them in a linear accelerator. Once they get up to about the speed of light, we put them into what we call the synchrotron ring, and the synchrotron ring is a storage ring um, for the electrons where we spin them around in a circular orbit. Um, we can steer them in a circular orbit using magnets, and we have different color magnets in the synchrotron for different purposes. Some of them focus the electrons, some of them steer the electrons, and once they get up to about the speed of light, those electrons spin, and as they turn, they give off energy, and the energy that they give off is in the form of light. And the light that they produce is primarily x-rays. So these beams of x-rays come down what we call a beam line, and at the end of the beam line is where we do experiments. So now we're standing up on the balcony above the experimental floor at NSLS2, and you can see the entire experimental floor behind me. And what I'd like to point out up here is actually one of the beam lines from bird's eye view. The beam line starts from the concrete wall, which you can see right there, and the beam line is the dark a metal pipe and inside that pipe is the x-rays which travel all the way down the beam line and eventually down just below me is an experimental station where scientists will actually insert their sample and perform the experiments. NSLS2 is a really large research facility. It's almost three quarters of a mile in circumference and so one of the best ways to get around the facility from beam line to beam line is by trike. Hop on and join me. Alright, so now we're standing at one of our structural biology beam lines called AMX, and it stands for the Automated Macromolecular Crystallography. And at this particular beam line, what we study are proteins and DNA. And what we want to do is we want to use the x-rays from the synchrotron to study the atomic structure of these proteins all the way down to the individual atoms and individual molecules that you see. The reason for that is for something that we call drug design. If you understand the structure of a protein which is in your body, if that protein is malfunctioning in a particular disease and you want to know if you want to develop a drug that's going to prevent that protein from functioning or help it to function to cure the disease, you need to understand the protein structure and how it actually binds to the drug. Think of this as a lock and a key where the lock is actually the protein and the key is the drug and you need to find the exact key that's going to fit 
into that protein in order to prevent the protein from functioning or in order to help the protein to function, whichever the case may be in the drug. Now this beamline is a very, it's a highly automated beamline. Back behind me is a robot that you can see. And this robot allows us to study many, many different drugs very quickly and how each one of those will react with the protein. So basically we have our lock and we have many, many, many different keys that we can study the interaction between them using the x-rays and the robot in order to do it very quickly. So one example that's happening um, nowadays here at this beamline is study of the spike protein in the coronavirus. The coronavirus is the protein that is the cause of the COVID-19 and the spike protein is actually one of the proteins that causes infectivity. And so if we can find a drug that will actually bind to the spike protein and prevent it from infecting a human cell, that will help to treat the disease. And so the, what's being studied here is the spike protein and many, many different drugs, many of which are commercially available. We're trying to understand whether any of these commercially available drugs will actually be able to function to inhibit the spike protein. And we use the protein crystallography to study at the atomic structure, this individual, the individual structure of the protein and how it binds or how that lock and the key fit together in order to prevent uh, infection in coronavirus. So that's just one example, but there are many, many more examples of how structural biology is used. We can study upwards of 500 or more different samples in a given day, so it's a very highly productive beamline for drug discovery. And incidentally, I'll add one more point that it's been, that we're very proud to say that more than 90% of the um, drugs that have been developed in the last 10 to 15 years have used synchrotrons like NSLS2 uh, in order to determine the structure of this lock and this key mechanism together. So that's structural biology. Now what I'd like to do is we'll take you on to our next beamline and take a look at something different. Follow me. Now we're standing at the Inner Shell Spectroscopy Beamline, or ISS for short. And the specialty for this beamline is to study catalytic reactions. And the example that I want to give you today is batteries. A lot of work goes on at this beamline to study batteries and how they actually function in real time. I bet that you can imagine that batteries are really important to me, they're really important to you because you want the battery in your cell phone, for example, to be smaller, you want it to charge faster, you want it to hold the charge longer, and you don't want to have to change the battery after having the phone for a few years. So the advantage of the ISS beamline is we can actually study what's happening in the battery in real time. And the advantage to that is we can actually then tweak the composition or the molecules in the battery in order to help it perform faster or for help it to charge faster, help it to hold its charge. And so what scientists will do is they'll prepare all different compositions of batteries, we put them in the x-ray beam and we compare the function to what the composition is in order to make it better. So that's just one example, let's move on to the next beam line. This is an X-ray fluorescence microscope beamline, or XFM for short. And as its name describes, what this does is a very, very bright X-ray fluorescence microscope, and that allows us to see the elemental composition of materials. And so one example that I can give you is we can look at the composition of plants. Uh, we can actually look at, we can stick an actual plant leaf right into the X-ray beam and we can raster scan it through that x-ray beam and we can get a picture of all the elements in the leaf. We can learn about the normal elements like carbon and oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, but we can also learn about things like contaminants, heavy metals, for example. And that's one particular application that we see being done on this beamline is something called phytoremediation, where scientists are using plants to actually bring heavy metals out of the soil into the plants and then the plants are taken out of the, removed and, and burned and you can actually recover the metal, but you also remove the heavy metal from the soil. And so, by, in order to do that, the sample gets put into the beam, the x-ray beam will come down, it will absorb into the leaf, and then the fluorescence is given off, 
So the x-rays will bounce around inside, they'll absorb. The detector will measure the fluorescence, and this detector will, is able to discriminate the different elements, the arsenic versus the carbon, the oxygen, and the nitrogen. And we get a picture of all of those elements all at the same time. So we can see where that heavy metal was located in, in the leaf, how much got into there, and how much got out of the soil. Another example of the X-ray fluorescence microscope is looking in the area of cultural heritage or looking at paintings. Uh, we've seen scientists bring paintings here where they want to identify the composition of the paints, which will help to date when the painting was made. We also look at dating the paints for forgeries in these paintings. And a third example in cultural heritage is actually looking at a painting behind the painting. So back in the days, um, the can canvas was very expensive, and so painters would actually paint a painting, and then instead of getting a new canvas, they'd paint a second painting on top of it. And because the x-rays are penetrating, we can actually take a picture with the x-ray fluorescence microscope of the image on top, and then also see the image back behind. So those are just some examples of how the X-ray fluorescence microscope beamline works. Now let's move on to our next beamline. So now we're standing at the six beamline, which is a huge beamline. So six stands for soft inelastic X-ray scattering, and this type of beamline is used to study things that we call quantum materials. And quantum materials are these next generation materials that we can use for many, many things. But we want to understand how the electrons move inside of these quantum materials. So an example of a quantum material is a superconductor. If you think of a normal copper wire that we use for transmitting uh, electricity, copper wires are very inefficient. They lose energy in the form of heat and other forms when electrons travel from one place to another. We'd like to have wires that have perfect efficiency, and that's what superconductors are. The problem with superconducting materials is that they only function at really, really cold temperatures. And what we need to do is develop these materials that they function at room temperature in order to be useful um, in our daily lives. And so this huge beam line is used to study these very, very small superconductors, and the way it's done is like this. We take the superconductor, the x-rays, we're going to shine the x-rays on the superconductor. They come from that tiny pipe back behind me. The x-rays will, and the sample go into this vacuum chamber right here to my right. The x-rays will scatter off of that superconductor into this long arm behind me. The scattered x-rays will go all the way down to the end to that detector, which is down there. This detector can then move along this rail, and so we can measure how the x-rays scatter as a function of angle. And when we measure how the x-rays scatter as a function of angle, it allows us to understand how the electrons are actually moving around inside that superconductor. Well, we've made it all the way around the synchrotron ring, and we're back to the NSL2 lobby. So that concludes our tour. Thanks for watching.